Hi, this video is all about the types of fossils that we can find in quaternary deposits and crucially how we can use those fossils to help us reconstruct the climatic changes that so characterise this period of geological time. Now there are different types of fossils we can use. Arguably the more useful of these are the microfossils. Extremely small fossils that we can find in uh, vast numbers where we can see um, changes in the distribution and occurrence of particular organisms in response uh, to different climates. One of the most important of these is fossil pollen. Pollen uh, produced by plants as part of their reproductive cycle does give us a, an indication of the vegetation community that existed uh, in, in the past. Pollen grains are, are tiny, um, they're produced uh, in vast numbers by plants, and really importantly, they're extremely robust things. Chemically, they're very um, uh, stable, uh, physically, they're quite tough. Um, the only thing really that they don't cope well with is prolonged exposure to oxygen. But that means if we find pollen, it's generally been deposited somewhere reasonably close to where it was produced. If it's trapped in an anaerobic environment, this material will preserve. It's also relatively easy to sample. As quaternary geologists, we're fortunate in that our material is very close to the surface and often unconsolidated. You can see a geologist here having sampled uh, a peat bog using uh, this uh, fairly simple manual device called a Russian corer that's pushed down into the ground to a, uh, a measured level, rotated through 180 degrees and simply pulled back out again, giving us this um, continuous core of um, unconsolidated sediment from which we can uh, take samples of about a cubic centimetre uh, at each level we want to sample uh, to give us uh, more than enough pollen to be able to analyse. To collect the pollen data then, the pollen is separated from the sediment in which it's found. You can see on the right here uh, a scanning electron microscope image of uh, different pollen grains, quite beautifully preserved in this particular case. And you can see the geologist on the left uh, using a binocular microscope uh, to uh, sort of methodically scan uh, a microscope slide full of um, pollen samples from a particular level within a core. Just by the geologist's right hand, you can see a whole series of counters. As the geologist identifies a particular type of pollen, he'll record one occurrence of that pollen grain, identifying species as he goes. It's quite a methodical and almost mechanical process. Uh, with some practice. This image gives uh, perhaps an indication of the of what it actually looks like to see pollen down these uh, uh, microscopes. It is possible to identify um, pollen grains certainly to genus level. It's a bit more difficult uh, to species level but we can see distinctive types of pollen from different um, genera of plants. Here are just some examples of typical pollens that we might find within a deposit. But they are identifiable. With all this data collected then, so we've counted the number of pollen grains of different species or different genera uh, at individual levels within a core, we can piece these together in a series 
of combined line graphs. And it creates what we call a pollen diagram. Each of the little horizontal axes are the percentage of the total amount of pollen from each level within the core. The vertical axis you can see here is time. This particular core clearly has been dated well, probably using radiocarbon dating. Once this data is collected, a geologist will then attempt to identify different zones within the pollen diagram. The zones represent different periods of vegetational change. Let me show you an example of one I've done. We can see that our first zone here I've identified because of the high amount of spruce. That then changes from about 13,000 to 12,000 years ago to woodland dominated by ash. Our third zone then, up to maybe 9,300 years ago, we see uh, elm and oak starting to take over. So perhaps what we're seeing here is a vegetation succession as, a, as the after the climate has warmed, after the end of the last ice age, about 14,000 years ago, we see uh, a gradual um, evolution of the vegetation community in this particular area in America. The next zone clearly is dominated by oak. We've got a, perhaps a climax vegetation community here. But about 5,000 years ago, that starts to change. In zone 5, we see oak becoming uh, less dominant. Perhaps the forest starting to break up a little into sort of wider clearings. We see uh, grass, we see ragweed starting to become a little bit more abundant. The final zones then are really determined by these other herb plants, particularly the uh, occurrence of goosefoot there about 2,000 years ago. This is subjective. But it is a way of helping us to uh, interpret the vegetation changes that have occurred. Now, it's not just plants that will give an indication of changing climates. Animals can do that as well. Beetles are an incredibly diverse group of animals whose distribution in many cases is determined by climate. It is possible, again because these organisms are abundant, because they're uh, robust, particularly chemically robust, um, to find these as fossils. This image shows uh, a fossil assemblage uh, from America. You can see that in this case we have, um, and fairly typically for beetle assemblages, uh, fragments of the uh, individual animals um, found within uh, the sediments. These fragments can be identified often to species level, They're very distinctive and often very beautiful uh, organisms. What that allows us to do is to look at, uh, by, well, it allows us to apply uniformitarianism to look at the current distribution of beetle species and compare that with where they're found in the fossil record. These two simple maps show the distribution of, of modern day um, beetle species, both of which have been found in quaternary sediments in the UK, actually in the east of Scotland. Now this would clearly indicate that the climate when these particular beetles existed in Britain must have been significantly colder than it is today. And we can actually define really quite accurately the range of climates at which um, these species live and therefore the climates that existed in Britain during the Quaternary.
As well as the microfossils, we also have macrofossils, the big ones. Now these, and in particular uh, the mammoth here, gives an amazing snapshot of the changes that have occurred through the Quaternary period. These animals were walking around the UK up to maybe six and a half thousand years ago. Sadly now extinct, but their adaptations gives an indication of changing climates. Now, the drawback, I suppose, with the vertebrates is in the number of fossils found. You know, we don't find as many of these as you know we can say for the beetles or, or even pollen. And we don't get, crucially, we don't get a sequence of these. This gives us a snapshot of climatic change rather than um, a sequence of climatic change. There are some other amazing animals that existed. Uh, through the fairly recent geological past. The immense Irish elk, for example, despite its poor naming. It's neither Irish nor an elk, but that's another story. The saber-toothed tiger from North America. A remarkable animal. So, we can see that quaternary fossils, in some cases, are very different to the ones we find native to uh, particularly Britain today. The distribution of fossils has changed over time. The distribution of animals has changed over time. In response to climatic changes. So if we can find fossils from the fairly recent geological past of animals that exist today in either much warmer or much cooler climates, we can use that to help us reconstruct what that climate was like in the past. They're an invaluable source of geological information. Okay, remember to come up with your interesting question and bring it along to class. I'll see you then.